Good day, everyone. This is Chris with the Ancient Scholar. Today we're going to be talking about uh, or going into a fluid and electrolyte balance, and we'll talk about fluids primarily today. So, as we know, fluids or water specifically um, makes up a large uh, component of the human body. In fact, approximately 50 to 70 percent of total body um, weight is going to be composed of water. So we're basically just a big bag of water with some uh, various other um, elements thrown in there for uh, flavor, if you will. Um, about 60% of the average male is fluid, made up of, of water, and 50% of the average female is made up of water. Um, now, in the body, we have two major compartments where all that water exists. We have the intracellular compartment, which is within the cells themselves, and then we have the extracellular compartment outside of the cells. Within the extracellular compartment, we have a few other subcompartments. You have the vascular, the intravascular in the blood vessels themselves, and you have the interstitial, which is actually um, outside of the blood vessels, but not within the cells. So you have a cell here, you have a blood vessel here, and there's a little space in between the vessel and the cell, and that's called the interstitial space. And sometimes when people get lots of swelling in that interstitial space, fluid leaks into it, uh, you'll hear the term third spacing, and that's actually what third spacing refers to is increased fluid in the interstitial space. Okay, but intracellular compartment, extracellular compartment, within the cell, outside of the cell. Most of the fluid within the human body exists within the intracellular compartment. Most of the fluid exists within the cells, not outside. Now, when we talk about the movement of water, water can move between the different compartments, the two, two major compartments. We'll kind of keep it simple. Water can either move out of the cells or into the cells. This movement of water in and out of different compartments is called osmosis. And osmosis is the movement of water um, down a concentration gradient. What does that mean? Well, that means if there's a concentration of something called solute, and solute is stuff that, that's dissolved in water, and water is a solvent, and a solvent is something that dissolves solute, or dissolves stuff. So if I drop a sugar cube in uh, a glass of warm water, mix it up, stir it up, and that sugar cube dissolves, well, the sugar is the solute, and the solvent is water. And... Uh, so basically, we have a bunch of water in our body as a solvent. Now, that water moves according to different concentrations of solute. For example, if it's very concentrated in the uh, vascular space, or the extracellular compartment, then water will leave the cells to where all that concentrated solute is. Okay? So let's say I have a patient in diabetic ketoacidosis. So they're diabetic, their blood sugars are really high, and uh, they're in an acidotic state. They've got a lot of sugar out in their, their vascular compartment. Well, fluid will leave the cells into the vascular compartment. The osmosis will cause that. And, of course, the cells will become dehydrated. And dehydra uh, intracellular dehydration is a big concern in patients um, that have DKA or diabetic ketoacidosis. Okay. We can also have situations where the um, concentration of solute inside of the cells is higher than outside. In that case, where do you think the water will, osmosis will go? Well, it will go into the cells. And, um, and we talked about uh, SIDH a little earlier, where um, the sodium in the vascular compartment becomes diluted because there's a little too much water. Um, and that becomes uh, very diluted, more diluted than the concentration of, of um, solute within the cells. And where do you think that water is going to go? It's going to shift into the cells and cause um, swelling and cerebral edema and things, things of that nature. Okay, so that's osmosis, is the movement of water with a concentration gradient. Now, diffusion is the movement of the stuff inside water. Diffusion is the movement of solute. Okay? And diffusion is the movement of solute from high concentration to low concentrations. Very different from osmosis. Osmosis is water. So, for example, I have that 
that cube of sugar, I drop that in the water, that cube of sugar is really concentrated, but what happens? It spreads out. It moves from high concentration to low concentration and spreads itself out um, among that. The same thing is going to happen in our body or is going to want to happen. Stuff from high concentrations are going to want uh, to, to uh, move to lower concentrations. Of course, we have cell membranes and things like that that can get in the way. There are different types of diffusion, and uh, we'll talk about them briefly. There's something known as passive uh, transport, and this is simply just the movement of an air, uh, a solute from a high concentration to low concentration. It just moves passively. Um, now, sometimes when we have a cell membrane that gets in the way, the solute wants to get into the cell, but it can't get through the cell membrane. And if that's the case, sometimes there's a protein channel that'll help get, get the, um, the solute, whatever it may be, into the cell. Um, that's known as facilitated diffusion, where I actually have a helper molecule that helps get that um, uh, solute through the membrane, generally through a protein channel. An example of facilitated diffusion would be insulin. I give uh, diabetic insulin, or even a normal person, they make insulin, the pancreas secretes it, and that insulin helps get glucose through the cell membrane. And uh, that's called facilitated diffusion. It's still moving with a gradient, though. There's not as much sugar inside of the cell as there outside of the cell. So it still will move with its gradient. Uh, we talked about osmosis. There's also something called filtration, and this will generally uh, occur in the kidneys. And what it is is it's movement of water and a dissolved uh, substance from high pressure to low pressure. And a perfect example of this would be what goes on in the kidney where um, uh, when we talk about the different tubules, the loop of Henry, Henley, um, the distal and the proximal convoluted collecting tubules, we know that there's pressure in those and then we have the collecting duct and the pressure in those tubule, tubules is often going to be higher than the pressure in the collecting duct and that's going to want to shift water and solute into the collecting duct, and then that stuff can be drained as urine. That's the process of filtration. And then there's something called active transport, which is almost exactly the opposite of diffusion, and that is transporting something against its gradient. So that would be like, let's say that I have lots of sodium outside of a cell, and not a whole lot of sodium inside of the cell, but the cell wants to get rid of that sodium. Well, it's going to have to push that sodium out of itself against a gradient. Now, this is not diffusion anymore. This is active transport because the cell has to use energy to push that against its gradient. And that's what actually occurs with the sodium-potassium pump in uh, depolarization, repolarization, if you remember that from anatomy and physiology. Okay. Now, when we talk about um, fluids and administering certain fluids, um, there are three different types of what we call concentrations of solutions. There is something called hypertonic, isotonic, and hypotonic. And uh, what I'm going to do is I actually have a little drawing that I made to kind of demonstrate this. And, and you guys should be fairly familiar with this, but again, we'll just get everyone on the same page. So if I have a hypertonic environment, that means these little triangles are um, solute. So that means that there's more solute outside, outside of the cell than inside. Well, where do you think the water is going to go when we talked about osmosis? Well, if it's more concentrated around the cell than inside, then the water will leave the cell. And it will cause the cell to become dehydrated. Certain types of diuretics that we administer, like mannitol, for people that have swelling in, in the brain from a brain injury, mannitol works on this principle. Mannitol is very concentrated. It's hypertonic. And um, it causes fluid to shift out of the cells. Now, an isotonic solution has the same tonicity. And here I have these little, these little, little, little pyramids here. They can be sodium or whatever you want to imagine. I have three outside, three inside. So it's the same tonicity. It's isotonic. And that means that the, wa the, wa the amount of water going into the cell is equal to the amount of water going out. So I do not have a net gain or net loss of um, fluids sif shifting in and out of this, the cell. Most of the medications that we administer in respiratory care, like albuterol, Zopinex, and things of that nature that, we, that we're talking about in pharmacology right now, 
um, are mixed or administered in, with isotonic solutions um, because I don't have significant shifting of water in and out of the cells. The last type of solution is, is something called hypotonic. I just put an O there for hypotonic, and that is where the solution is less concentrated outside of the cell than inside of the cell. Well, where do you think water is going to shift if it's hypotonic? Well, water will shift into the cell and it will cause the cell to, to swell. Now, in respiratory care, sometimes what we'll do is we'll actually administer highly concentrated saline solutions to our patients. We'll actually nebulize it, and they'll breathe it in. And what it will do is it will draw water out of the cells. Um, this will be in their airways. And, and water will be drawn out. It, the airways will become kind of irritated. And um, what that will do is that will help them cough up mucus. And sometimes when we do what's called a mucus induction, where we want to get a mucus sample, we will administer a hypertonic saline, um, a high, high, highly concentrated saline solution. Um, and uh, what's the normal concentration of saline solution isotonic? It's 0.9% is a isotonic concentration. Um, more concentrated at, than that, say 1%, 2%, 3%, et cetera, is going to be hypertonic. Now, when we do this, if we do a sputum collection and induction giving a hypertonic solution, we need to be very careful because this can be very irritating to the lungs. Okay, guys, I'm going to go ahead and cut it off here, and that is our introduction to uh, fluid and uh, mainly fluid balance. We'll talk about electrolytes in the next video.